will continue our lecture on instrumental variables and in this and the next video we're gonna talk about the late the, the local average treatment effect let me motivate or let me tell you what that is and motivate what we're doing here and why so we have said in one of the previous videos that an instrumental variable if it is valid and if there is a significant first stage allows us to identify a causal effect and that makes it very attractive because we oftentimes have the problem of unobserved heterogeneity and or measurement error and uh, we can do away with these endogeneity problems if we have a valid IV. However, one problem or one challenge with instrumental variables is that the, the parameter, the causal parameter that we identify is different from the parameter we would identify if everyone was forced to take the treatment. Right? So if, if everyone was forced to take the treatment and we would randomly assign the treatment, but everyone who gets it would have to actually take it, then we would get a, an, an effect that is representative of the population. However, the way instruments work is different. Instruments are can be seen as an encouragement for people to take the treatment, so an incentive. And we would not be good economists if we didn't believe that people respond to incentives. And people respond to incentives differently depending on their preferences, depending on their economic circumstances. So if people receive, for example, a voucher that allows them then to move to a better neighborhood, we have seen that there, there was 50% of the voucher recipients who moved and 50% who stayed. And there is reasons to believe that those 50% who moved do so because they think they're better off and they're probably different from those people who believed it was not worth it and who did not move. So there's no reason to believe that the, the, those who received the voucher and moved and those who, did, who received the voucher but did not move, that they are similar. They're, they may be similar, but they're certainly not the same. And what an instrumental variable estimator identifies is the causal effect for those people who are units whose behavior is changed by the instrument, the so-called compliers. And the, the L in, in local average treatment effect, the local, refers to those compliers, which is a particular part of the overall population that we're interested in. And as such, the parameter we're estimating is a causal parameter, but it's no longer representative of the population we're interested in. And for anyone who does work using instrumental variables, it's very important to understand what parameter is actually identified by an instrumental variable estimator. And I would even want to go further and say, every estimator is a weighted average. And it's very simple to for us to know what an average is, what is hard is to understand the weights that go into this weighted average. And in the last three, four years, there have been a series of papers showing that the conventional interpretations that we have used for estimators such as difference in differences, IV, uh, regression discontinuity, are actually not correct because we have incorrectly interpreted the weights that go into those estimators. And uh, the, the, with instrumental variables, we will encounter this problem for the first time. However, with instrumental variables, 
this, uh, this has been known for a long time. And so researchers have already developed some tools that allow us to better understand that. So let's dive into it. And let's start with a little bit of notation. I noticed there is a, a typo here. This should be a zero. Um, okay, so we have here a situation where we have a binary instrument. So the instrument is Z. Think again about the voucher. And then we have a, a, a binary treatment, which is in the, in the moving to opportunity example, whether the person actually moves or not. Right? So then we denote as D1, the treatment status of person I when they have received the voucher or when the instrument is one and D0, the treatment status when they have not received the, the voucher or when the instrument is zero. Right? You may say, well, but could that not, is that not just be zero for everyone? Not necessarily, right? It's unless uh, everyone in a poor neighborhood who is forced to stay there, um, people will move away. And some people without having received the voucher will move to a better neighborhood. And then their treatment status will be one as well. So then for each person, we observe their treatment right? and their treatment is can be expressed as a combination of both treatment statuses and the instrument, which is this equation down here, which is sometimes called the switching equation. Right? So the idea is that without the without having received the treatment, their treatment status is D naught, whereas if they if the instrument is one instead of zero, um, their treatment status actually switches from D naught to D one. Right? So you can think about it as follows. Um, it ju just plug in different values for the instrument here into the switching regression and you will immediately see what happens, right? So if, if, uh, if Z equals zero, then the person's treatment status is D naught I, okay? If Z equals one, then the person's treatment status is D zero I, plus d1i minus d0i equals d1i. Right? It's very simple, but um, we're doing this because the useful thing about that is we can turn that into a regression equation. So we can turn this, this, um, this switching equation into a regression equation and simply then add an error term that is mean zero. Um, and so, we have then this equation here, which actually has a straightforward interpretation. Right? So if we, if we ran that regression and knew what those, those delta parameters are, we, we would know exactly, um, we, we would have an interpretation for, for delta naught and delta one. What is delta naught? Well, delta naught again is the treatment status for a person who has not been encouraged to take the treatment. And then um, delta one is the, the, the change in the treatment status for a person who has been encouraged to take the treatment relative to what the treatment status would have been had they not received, had they not been encouraged. Yeah? So for, for someone, uh, whose uh, treatment status, uh, sorry, whose instrument status is one, where Z I equals one, um, their treatment status D I equals gamma naught plus gamma one. Okay, so, so this, this is just the, the, the notation here and how we relate these two different uh, the, the treatment statuses for people for whom the instrument was zero and for the 
the instrument was one, how we relate the two, and, and how we bring that into a regression framework. Now, an important insight here is that the effect of that the instrument has on an individual's treatment status may vary by individual. That is very, uh, very, very important. And this is what makes IV so hard to interpret. So if you see here, that parameter delta 1i varies by individual. So for some people, if they are encouraged, they will, they have a high delta and they are very likely once they are encouraged to take the treatment, to take it. Other people, um, may, for, for them, Delta-1 may simply be zero. They would not switch their treatment status if they're encouraged, either because they would always take the treatment or they would never take it. Hmm. And so, so that is something that, that we, is a challenge that we will encounter uh, in in future on future slides now if we want to study this a little bit more systematically we it's best to split the population up into four principal strata so we have four types of imaginary people and the they are distinguished by what the, the status of the instrument is, so whether they have been encouraged to take the treatment or not, and what their treatment status is. So, what are those? The first group is the one that IV estimation is all about. These are the compliers. The compliers are those who, if encouraged, take the treatment, but if they're not encouraged, they don't take the treatment. And that's, that's what you can see here. So, so here, D1 means the person has taken, uh, has been encouraged. And then that equals one here means that they've actually taken the treatment. D0 means they have not been encouraged. And then that equals zero means they actually don't take the treatment. Also, so these are the people who, if they receive a voucher, they move. If they don't receive a voucher, they don't move. These are the people whose behavior is influenced by the instrument. Then you have two groups whose behavior is not affected by the instrument, either because they always take the treatment regardless or they never take the treatment regardless. And so, so in that case, um, you know, it would be someone who would have moved anyway or someone who would never move, no matter what that voucher would actually allow them to do. And these are respectively always and never takers. And then you have another group, a, a fourth group, which are the, the toddlers among the, the principal strata. These are called defiers. These are people who, who react in the opposite way of what the instrument would encourage them to do. So these are the people who, if the instrument gives them an incentive to take the treatment, they don't take the treatment. But if the instrument does not give them that incentive, they actually do take the treatment. And now it depends very much on the context whether defiers are plausible or not. Um, you know, in, in, in things like uh, in, in crime research, uh, or in research that has to do with, with health behaviors, you may well have defiers in, in your population. Um, in other contexts, maybe less so. The challenge that we have is that from any data set, it's actually not possible to see who is a complier, an always taker, a never taker, or a defier. At least we cannot pinpoint all those groups at the same time. We can, and this is where some of the research, recent research is, is heading, we can obviously use uh, machine learning techniques 
to, to try and pinpoint some subgroups that are most likely compliers and most likely overtakers and so on. But we cannot fully disentangle and say in the sample, you are a complier and you are an always taker and you're a never taker. Why is this? The reason is that here we have people's potential outcomes and we have their treatment status if encouraged or if not encouraged. But for each person or for each group, one of these statuses is hypothetical because for each person, we only observe one treatment status. So we only observe that the person either gets treated or doesn't get treated. So if you observe someone who gets treated and we observe that they were encouraged by the instrument, then either that's a complier or that's an always taker. And so, so therefore it's, it's, it's impossible to dis disentangle one from the other. And so what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through the, the workhorse model for understanding the local average treatment effect. Um, so that's the angrist imbens rubin causal model, which defines the minimum set of assumptions for the identification of a causal effect. And uh, alongside, I will present an example, which is one of the, the quintessential IV papers, um, now 30 years old, um, by, by Josh Angrist. So what Angrist was interested in in that, that paper was the impact of being a, a Vietnam war veteran on earnings. So this was obviously a huge question in, in the US, um, whether uh, people who served in, in Vietnam, uh, whether they suffered earnings losses from that, either because of injuries or because of trauma or because of some sort of stigma. So there's many reasons why this, this, this can happen. And so what Angrist used there as an instrument was that the, um, the US draft happened through a lottery. So the way this worked was that each person each man of draft age received a lottery number that then determined their priority for conscription. So if you had a particularly low number on that, in that lottery, you were more likely to get drafted. If you had a high number, you were less likely to get drafted. This was, this was done for fairness reasons. Now, the compliance with that policy was obviously not, not perfect um, because, first of all, those who had a very low number and would have been very likely to, to go, they could obviously, they could either dodge the draft or they, they were, some of them were also exempted for, for, for health or other reasons. So they were eligible for the draft, which means they, were, they would have been drafted but they, they, they may have been exempt. But then others who were not eligible may have volunteered. Okay, so here you have again the situation where you have an instrument that's the lottery or the lottery number, which is an encouragement to be treated. And the treatment is whether they actually served in Vietnam or not. And then even those people who, who would not be encouraged by the instrument, they could still serve. The question is then in the first stage, did those that were encouraged, did those, were those more likely to serve than other people who were not encouraged by the instrument? And that, that, we, will, that we will see. So the first stage we can, we can check but uh, I can tell you already that, that it, it, it certainly mattered. So, so the lower your lottery number, the greater was the likelihood that, that, that you actually had to, to serve in, um, and in, in, in Vietnam. 
But the big question with any IV is what about the exclusion restriction? Um, and there are two aspects to instrument validity. One is, is the instrument as good as randomly assigned? And then does it affect, and that's the exclusion restriction, does it affect the outcome that is earnings only through its effect on the treatment and through no other effect? Now, the lottery was random. So we should not have an issue with conditional independence. Um, and also, it seems reasonable to assume that, that it only had an effect on veteran status. Now, one could think about other mechanisms, right? So if you have a very low lottery number and you know that you will get drafted, um, you know, people may start engaging in riskier health behaviors that have then also an effect on, on later life, uh, life outcomes such as earnings um, or they may develop mental health problems that are unrelated to them actually serving in the army and that, that may have an effect um, later on. So, so there, there, could be, um, there could be reasons why the exclusion restriction is not valid here. Okay, but, but for the moment, let's assume it is, and, and, and I think um, one can make a very good case. So the instrument um, in this case is defined uh, as, as follows, that uh, Z equals 1 is, is if the lottery implies that the person will be draft eligible and Z 0 otherwise. And then the treatment is uh, whether they actually served in the army um, or not. And so this is obviously what the what the, the econometrician observes. They observe the lottery number or whether they were draft eligible and they observe whether someone actually served in Vietnam or not. Okay, so that's the treatment status. And here, obviously, the the, the causal question is not whether a high or low lottery number has any effect on, on people. No one really cares about that, right? What people care about is, well, what, what is the effect of veteran status on earnings? And so the causal effect that we want to study, again, here expressed for the individual, not in a population, but for each individual, we would like to know what is the effect of serving in Vietnam, regardless of the instrument status. Yeah. That's, that's what we, that's what we want to know. Yeah. Well, what, but the problem is obviously that we, for each person only observe one treatment status. So we observe their instrument, but then also we only observe that person's treatment status, but we don't observe the counterfactual, which is, for example, suppose you observe a person who has served in Vietnam, you don't know what that person's wages are, had that person not been, not served in Vietnam, but their, their draft status would have been, draft eligibility status would have been the same. Okay. So what we are looking for here, or what, what we, the problem we are facing here is that of a missing counterfactual. And almost always, causal inference is actually a missing data problem. So we have data that we would need in order to make a, so there is data that we would need to make a causal statement, but we don't have it. And we cannot have it because we can only observe a person who either served in Vietnam or did not serve in Vietnam, but we cannot observe the same person at the same time doing both. That, that is not possible. Right? Obviously, in, in a, what the, the, the workaround there is then to, to compare people who did serve to those who did not and use then their draft eligibility status as an instrument. So we, we do a comparison across people, right? across different people. 
Whereas what we need to focus on when we want to understand the, uh, the, the causal parameter that, that the IV estimator is, is, um, is identifying is actually the potential outcomes for each individual person, or at least for several types of people. Okay? And so the, the, the potential outcomes for one person are, are those that you can see here. Okay? So, so again, this is the person's earnings for a given draft eligibility status, the person's earnings if that person served in Vietnam versus the person's earnings had that person not served in Vietnam, but had the same draft eligibility status. That's what the counterfactual then would be. So we will have to then make a good few assumptions that allow us to, uh, to estimate that causal effect. And to some extent, you've heard them before in, in previous videos. I'm just going to reiterate them here with that notation that, 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 uh, that we've just introduced. Yeah? Um, and again, going back and forth between the, the, the actual uh, causal model and the, um, and the example from, from Angrist. And so the first assumption is that the, tr the, the instrument is as good as randomly assigned. Um, so here, again, there, there's a, a typo, apologies. Um, no, sorry, sorry, this is not a typo, actually. Sorry. Um, it's actually that w what it says here is that the assignment of the instrument is random, as in each person in the sample, person, in this case, per, for any person I and person J, they on average have the same probability of being assigned the treatment. Okay? So what that means is that uh, in, in, in the case of the draft lottery is that each person has the same probability of having a high or a low uh, lottery number and the same probability of being draft eligible. So what that gives us then is um, it allows us to, to identify the two intention to treat effects, namely the effect of the, um, of the instrument on the on the treatment that's here which is equivalent to the first stage and the effect of the instrument on the outcome and so so this would be the, the equation two here would be what is the effect of having like being draft eligible on the likelihood of actually serving in Vietnam, that's what the equation two tells us. Equation three tells us what is the effect of having, of being draft eligible on earnings. Okay, so it's not the effect of the draft on earnings, it's the effect of being draft eligible on earnings. So it's the reduced form, the intention to treat effect. A second uh, assumption is equivalent to the first stage, which uh, is called here in, in, in Angus Immens Rubin, uh, in, in, their, um, in their terms, is called non-zero average causal effect of the instrument on the treatment. So what does that mean? It means that the instrument must change some unit's behavior. Huh? So it, the, the probability of treatment should not be the same for people who, res, who were encouraged by the instrument and those who were not. And so, so, so that's what that, that um, inequality sign shows us here. And so, so this, this is obviously testable, um, but, but it's an important assumption that, that goes into the model. The third assumption we've also come across previously 
is the exclusion restriction. And here is sometimes where people confuse the conditional independence assumption, which is or ignorability assumption, as it is sometimes called, and the exclusion restriction. Both of them together um, define instrument validity. So an instrument can only be considered valid if it satisfies the exclusion restriction and if the conditional independence assumption holds. Okay? But these are two different things. The conditional independence assumption is fulfilled if the instrument is as good as randomly assigned, which you can possibly test with at least or provide or corroborate with balancing tests. Um, whereas the exclusion restriction is really the, the, the tough one here because it tells you that the instrument must affect the outcome only through the treatment and no other channel. So, so if you think about the, the DAGs again, so we have here the effect of the instrument on the treatment and then on the outcome. Suppose there was another effect, a direct effect here on the outcome, then the instrument would be invalid, even if it's randomly assigned. Okay, so, so if the instrument affects the outcome through a different channel, then the treatment through any other channel, it's invalid. The exclusion restriction does not hold. So take the example of, uh, suppose if people get a very low lottery number, they know they most likely have to go to Vietnam. There is a, there is a non-zero chance that they're going to die or getting injured. So they're going to just uh, enjoy their lives in the meantime. Some of them develop some addiction and that affects then their, their earnings, something along those lines. If that's a possibility, um, which has nothing, and, and that behavior may not necessarily have to do, have anything to do with the treatment status per se, um, it's just the expectation that, that they're most likely to get treated, um, then that, that may be one violation of the exclusion restriction here. Huh? So formally, the exclusion restriction is the, the following, um, is that the, the potential outcomes of that person should not depend on the status of the instrument. Okay. So given the treatment, the assignment of the instrument should not affect the outcome. Well, that, that, that's exactly what that DAG up here, uh, up here tells you. So if that's the case, if the instrument affects the outcome only through the treatment and not through any other channel, we can then define the individual causal effect of the treatment on the outcome as follows. Yeah, so so it's, it's just the difference in outcomes of people who've been treated versus those who have not been treated. Yeah, but, but again, here we're talking about an individual treatment effect. So it's the difference in the outcome had that person been treated relative to had that person not been treated. Again, this difference is not observed in the data. We either observe the person's earnings and that person served in Vietnam, or we observe that person's earnings and the person did not serve in Vietnam, but we do not observe those two earnings for the same person. That, that's simply impossible. Right? That's a fundamental problem of causal inference. Now, a fourth assumption that goes in here. So we've had so far, we had ignorability. Oh, as good as random assignment. We had the first stage, we had the exclusion restriction. A fourth assumption that's also important is monotonicity. What does monotonicity tell us or require? It requires that the instrument affects the treatment status of all units in the same direction. And if 
if it's a binary case, this is this is uh, very simply put, which is no one does the opposite of their assignment. So you have no defiers. So what it means is that people on who have been encouraged to take the treatment should be more likely to take the treatment than people who have not been um, uh, who have not been um, encouraged to take the treatment. That's what the first stage tells us. But this is a stronger assumption, which tells us that for anybody in 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 our sample, the the instrument should change their behavior in the same direction. So if you're getting encouraged, if people are getting encouraged to be treated, for example, they, they, they are draft eligible because of the lottery, that either doesn't change their, their treatment status or it changes it from zero to one, as in that, that they're actually getting drafted. Yeah? Um, this assumption would be violated if there were defiers so if there was some people who, if they were encouraged to take the treatment, they would not take the treatment. But if they were not encouraged, they would take it. Okay? So, so, so here what we require is monotonicity, which does not mean that everyone who gets encouraged actually takes the treatment, but it's that people who get encouraged to take the treatment either take it or don't take it. Um, but there is no, no defiers, no people who react the opposite way. And so what, what those, those assumptions two and four, so the first stage and monotonicity together give us is strong monotonicity, at least, so which means you have at least one complier. So the probability of the treatment is ever so slightly higher for those who were encouraged than for, for those who were not encouraged. That's what, what at least one complier tells you. And there are no units for whom who would do it the exact opposite, no defiers. Now, in practice, which are the, 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 the tricky ones? The tricky ones are usually the exclusion restriction and uh, the first assumption ignorability. Monotonicity can, in some cases, play an important role as well, um, but it's in, in many cases, defiers can be excluded. Uh, it, it's just implausible that there are defiers, but you have to check the context. So let's put all these things together and think about the compliance types. Okay, so, so let's first look at their treatment statuses if their instrument was either zero or one. So among those people who were not encouraged, if they are in, in that, and, and these are the people who were encouraged by the instrument. And here we can exactly have those four groups. So the, the, the two on the main diagonal are easy. Okay, so these are the people who are either never takers, so regardless of whether they're encouraged or not, they just never take the treatment. The always takers are also easy. These are the ones who, no matter what, they will always take the treatment. But then you have the compliers and defiers. And the compliers are the ones who take the treatment if encouraged, don't take the treatment if not encouraged. So that's, that's exactly the, the, the right ones. And then we have the defiers here, which again are those who always do the opposite. When they're encouraged, they don't take the treatment, but when they're not encouraged, they take the treatment. Now, if we look at this in a different way, and look at the compliance types by treatment status and instrument, we can see that why it's so hard to pinpoint those different compliance types in any data set. And the reason is that there is those that in each cell you could have either or. Okay? So in your data set, you don't observe 
these two potential outcomes or these two treatment statuses here. You observe their treatment status, um, but you don't observe what their alternative treatment status is had they not been encouraged. So for example, um, you observe for people that they, so suppose you observe someone who is draft eligible, so their instrument is one, and then you observe whether they are actually getting drafted or not. But you don't know what would have happened to them had they not been encouraged. So had they not been draft eligible. So this, this table up here is conceptually important, but we cannot observe it. Our reality as econometricians is the one over here, which is we observe their treatment status. We observe what their instrument is. And then the groups can be either or. So if someone has not been encouraged and does not take the treatment, that's this cell down here, that can either be a never taker, but it can also be a complier. We don't know. Then let's go to, to this group over here. If you observe the person has been encouraged, but and, and also takes the treatment, that can either be a complier, but it also can be an always taker. And we cannot distinguish because we don't know what, what they would have done had they not been encouraged, because we don't observe that. Yeah? And now with, with always the never takers and defiers, it's the same thing. Now suppose we can exclude that there are defiers, so that's this gone, then at least we can pinpoint people in the sample who are certainly always takers and certainly never takers. Okay? So let's start with, uh, with this cell uh, here. Let's start with, with those that we can pinpoint that are definitely always takers. These are the people who take the treatment even though they have not been encouraged. And so they must be always takers. They cannot be compliers because if they were compliers, they wouldn't take the treatment because they haven't been encouraged. So they must be always takers if we exclude the fires. And the same here, if we observe people who are encouraged but don't take the treatment, they must be never takers. So at least by excluding the fires, we can, we can get a bit more information out of our data. Right? So, so this, is, this is what we get through monotonicity. What we're going to do in the next video is we're going to put all those different elements, those different groups and their individual treatment effects. We put them all together and um, try to understand how the estimator, the IV estimator, is a weighted average over all those individual treatment effects. And so you have people who are compliers, people who are never takers, people who are always takers, and each of them is in each of those groups for good reason, because for the always takers, it always pays off to take the treatment. For the never takers, supposedly never. And for the compliers, well, they respond at the margin to the instrument. And so the estimator that we're getting is a weighted average across the, the treatment effects for all those people in the sample who belong to those different groups. And so the key to understanding most of econometrics is to understand weights, to understand what weights go into a weighted average and how that that weighted average can then be interpreted so more on that in the next video